So Patrick, the floor is okay. yours. Um, this is my first talk of this kind, so please bear with me and forgive for any mistakes. Okay. I went to Donald Journey Traveling Fellowship in 2020. I applied for it in December of 2019, and I did not expect there to be a pandemic. And that explains why I went last year. And it's something I first found out about. Uh, I, I always drew as a kid. It's something I was always really passionate about. This, this is actually a view from my uncle's house in Poland. And I, when I went there in the summers, I loved it there compared to boring New Jersey suburbia. I think that really instilled a love for the natural world. And as I was young, I found my way to painting and to the fine arts. And I first heard about the Donald Journey Traveling Fellowship through Mark Delezio's blog in 2016, right when I found out about the Florence Academy, found out about contemporary fine art in a representational manner. I was not aware that there were painters around and the first time I heard about it, I knew that was something I wanted to do. And after three-ish years at the Florence Academy, I felt ready to apply for it and I was really fortunate to get it. And fast forward to last summer, I... So does anyone care to hear about the uh, technical preparations I had to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try. Wait, you know what? Sephora <laughs> wants to know too. <laughs> Step closer, maybe. Yeah, that's easy. Yeah, um, move, move the, no, I can't because oh, I can't because of the videos. So I'll just oh. try to project loud. Oh, okay. But oh, thank you for letting me know. So, Sorry, it's being video. So before I'll get to the traveling and everywhere I went, I'll get to some of the preparations. What I did was I backpacked my way through Europe. I bought myself a train pass. I had two backpacks along with me. One of them I brought to show the basics of what I brought along with me. I painted in oils. So I brought most of the paintings I did there. And most of them were 9x12s on Archer's oil paper and eventually I mounted them on the board after I got back home. But the Arches oil paper was really nice because at the end of the summer, this stack was only about this thick and I constructed this little panel carrier. I think this might be the most important part, the paper of the panel carrier. You know, it normally fits three 9x12s. I got some illustration board, I put some paper clips and I would paper clip my paintings on paper to both sides and have it dry. And in the summer heat, they dried relatively fast. So I'd have rotations of paintings I'd be drying in here. When they'd be dried to the touch, I would just stack them all up back into the arches pad that I bought the paper in. Uh, for my Pashad box, is there a question? Uh, for my Pashad box, I made one. I can give you guys recommendations, but I can't actually give you guys uh, something to buy. I made this so it would be uh, really low profile and uh, just what I would need. It's 10 by 14 by one inch thick. I would have my paintings on here. You could see exactly where the paintings were on the top lid. I'd have my panel, I'd have a little, what's it called, the thing you put the oil in? So Palette cup? Palette. I'd have a palette cup, I'd have a palette knife here, and this all attached onto a tripod, and that's that. Is there wood on the bottom? Yeah. Is that, like, just, is that just the tin? It, it's just wood. wood. It, uh, it, just yeah. it gets its own shine eventually, just to build up. It's very nice. Exactly which arches did you use? The oil paper. No, the, is it what, what weight and... Well, they, they only have one weight. They come in a red color instead of an orange or a green, and it's specially Hot prepared press? for oil painting. I think oh. it's a cold pressed. I think it's a cold pressed 300 grams per square meter, but they only have one oil painting paper. The okay. rest are watercolor papers, yep. and so it's one pad that's specifically for oil paint. I think it's sized with something probably in acrylic. I. Did not wash my brushes for two months. 
<laughs> I carried them all like this. I would dip them in a little bit of linseed oil every now and then, and that kept the paint in them always wet. Uh, these aren't the same brushes I had, but this is the same little bamboo carrier. And I carried around a little bag of paints. If I'd run out, I would resupply in whatever city I was in. But that's basically it. All of that fit into this bag. And I bought this bag off of Amazon just because it converts into a messenger bag. So I have a strap that I could carry it when I had my actual backpack. <coughs> my clothes and everything else that you just need to have to travel and backpack and whatever. Any questions on that? Did you fry your paper? Paper? No, I wish I did because from the pad, the Arches oil paper is very absorbent, but I just dealt with it. Well, what would you do? Patrick, you repeat the questions when, because uh, people in the back can't hear the questions. Okay, Tara asked if I primed the paper before I painted on it. I didn't, I just bought the pads. I am very bad with time management and I could not fit the prime. 50 some surfaces before my trip, and it was too much. Uh, Janet? Did you mail anything home or did you actually carry them the whole entire time? So I carried them halfway, or through half of the trip, and then I resupplied because I do have family in Eastern Poland. Okay. My parents are immigrants. That's I flew in and out of Warsaw when I first went to Europe for the summer. I was in Europe for about two and a half months. Halfway through, I came back because my family was also visiting. So I left about the 20 some paintings I made there and then I carried the rest with me. But it, you know, wasn't that, uh, it wouldn't have been that much. I would have just stored them in my separate backpack if that was the case. Working on the paper made things very light for the amount of painting I was able to do. Uh, Jin or Nathan, did you guys have questions? Or? I was going to ask, what would you have done to prepare the surfaces in retrospect? Probably another, I would have probably, if I could prepare them, I would have probably painted a toned layer of acrylic paint on it. Uh, the one thing I didn't like about the paper was that it was white. Some of these paintings yeah. have little annoying white dots that are just the pores that I didn't do a good enough job of covering it. And so that was one thing I'd do differently. So you would just tone it with a, a pigment layer instead of a sizing layer? Then. Yeah, I, and I would do it acrylic, so it would also be less absorbent. Okay. That was also one thing that That's was a little annoying. Mean, yeah, a little less yeah. absorbent. And I only used oil as a medium. Uh, I didn't use any solvents. I didn't carry around any of that with me. I just stocked up on a tiny bottle of linseed oil. It worked pretty well. How did you protect them from smearing? As you were drawing them, you had that box. Really. Uh, so, and that, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't have that problem uh, for whatever reason. You know, there was enough space between all the okay. illustration boards where I'd have them drawing on both sides, and I'd be very careful. I'd sometimes get dirty attaching the wet paintings onto there with the paper clips, and some of the edges here aren't clean, or some of the edges still have, you know, white on it. But uh, not the most important thing. The main painting is in the middle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they say not to put details in the edges anyway. Oh, what kind of wood did you use to make your box? Good, Good you question. Good question. I, I bought it. Uh, what kind of wood did I use to make my box? And so. Were you, were you willing to pass it around or if you or if you're comfortable? Yeah, 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 yeah. This thing's uh, this thing's tough. It actually broke on me halfway through, but I was lucky. I was able to get it fixed the next day. Uh, I made a design mistake on the this, but so this is finished birch plywood, uh, similar to Baltic birch. Yeah. It's not the regular plywood you buy at a hardware store. The uh, layers are. It's more expensive. The layers are thinner, and it's solid like a solid one millimeter veneer or half millimeter veneer and it is the plywood's glued together with an exterior grade of glue so it's very sturdy and i just finished it with some danish oil yeah you can also buy um, mahogany ply which is made the same way 
if you wanted them up, I'm going to go up. It's more expensive. The birch wood is good. Yeah. So, how about, how about the side here? Not to get like too secure. Without assuming to change the course of your presentation, my dying question is what did you find so, like, the most memorable in your backpack? We'll definitely get there. Thank you. Um, Dan, do you have one more technical question and then technical. we can move on? Yeah, Which just more the... technical stuff. What kind of wood is this one? That, that's, uh, it, it's from Home Depot. It's not Something expensive. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it's just, it, it doesn't have any technical strength to it. I think yeah. like the real strength comes from the two pieces of the oh, finished birch. Yeah. It looks really effective. I think it's, it, it starts with a B. I think it's basswood. Oh yeah. It's like in the craft section of Home Depot. Oh really? Uh, well, so I guess I'll get in with the actual journey of it. So there was a little bit of preparation. I was planning out all this uh, months in advance. I knew I wanted to build myself a panel carrier. I knew I wanted to build myself uh, a shot box. I had this relatively small uh, tripod easel as well. Sturdy carbon fiber, got it off Amazon. That's basically that. And so the, what I wanted to do with the fellowship, with the grant, because the way it works, it's, it's a very open-ended thing. The Donald Journey Traveling Fellowship, that's what I applied for and was very lucky to win. It's a lump sum grant of $5,000 for an American painter to go and travel Europe. And so past winners have done different things and I just wanted to take that and stretch it as far as I could go and visit as many places as I could see and mostly see as many important museums as I could see. I mostly stuck to the major cities, a lot of major capitals, and I visited big museums. I think the one place on my bucket list I still have left in Europe is probably London. It's like a major place. I uh, visited. I visited. Ended up. I ended up visiting over eight countries, like thirty cities, I think. And I saw a whole lot of painting. And I think, as ultimately as an artist, it's really important to get out there into the world and to get out of, you know, the small corner that you were born in and see some of the history and see some of the things that have come before us. And that's what I wanted to do. And I was painting all the way because I like to paint and I thought it'd be really fun. And I learned a lot from going to museums and seeing the things and then going, you know, in the evenings I would go paint after the museums were closed or in the early mornings I'd be painting. So uh, with all the pictures, uh, these are some of, this is a view from my uncle's terrace. This is the road that my mom grew up on. Behind those trees was where my grandparents built their house. A different uncle now lives there. Three other uncles live on the other side. Very rural, very picturesque area. You know, another field not far from their house. It's just plain lands, farmlands. There, there are some seats over here if you guys would want. Okay. And so moving on. I figured I have these paintings in chronological order. I made about 50 of them. So I figured I could like slide them down the table. I, I don't know if passing them all around probably wouldn't be a great idea. But so, you know, I went, my cousin had her wedding. I spent a little bit of time with my family and I did a little painting, did a little bit of getting used to the paper. And then my first stop ended up being Warsaw, which is the capital of Poland. That's me standing next to one of, the artist's name is Jan Mateko. He was a historical Polish painter in the 1900s. The interesting thing about Poland compared to a lot of other countries in Europe is they don't have the longest artistic tradition. And when you go to many of their museums, they're mostly filled with amazing 19th century paintings. And so he was a historical painter active in the late 19th century. Uh, he's done lots of just huge paintings like that. Uh, another show, uh, Anna Blinska, that was one thing I saw. Uh, she was a really talented female painter in the late 19th centuries, educated in Paris. Uh, a lot of Polish painters studied abroad because Poland itself wasn't a country for 
various reasons, yada, yada, yada. Uh, the exhibition was really cool. Uh, part of it was set up as if it was a 19th century atelier. They had her actual brushes and painting <coughs> kit here. And they're the same ones that you'd see in her self-portrait. And she did several self-portraits throughout her life. Uh, this one remained unfinished because she died at a really young age. But it's very interesting to see how she got the drawing, she got a tone, and then she just went to town finishing section by section. And uh, that's almost the way I ended up working on a lot of my paintings. Uh, the first painting I did in Warsaw really came out kind of bad. It wasn't that good. And I was like, oh gosh, I need to, I need to do something differently. <laughs> Everybody look at the work. And, and, and the main thing I was like, what if I draw before I paint? Like, I, I was working on paper, I had my mechanical pencils, so I ended up uh, sketching a lot. Uh, this is an Alma Tadema that they have in Warsaw. They have some really nice paintings. They have uh, the best, uh, what's his name, Charles Domini, the French Barbizon painter I've ever seen. It's not well lit, but it's amazing painting. Uh, this was Krakow, my next stop. That's the town square in the back. Uh, some really beautiful things. You know, so the next painting came out better, I would say. I spent a little bit more time on it. It was a very overcast day. It's one of the central cathedrals in the city square of Krakow. I, I ended up painting a lot of churches because they were some of the most beautiful buildings in these cities, in my opinion. Uh, you know, for various reasons. And this was this finished painting. This is actually a museum. So in the city square, in the center, in the heart of the old district, they have this building, which on the first floor, it used to be a cloth market in the 19th century. The first floor is still some market where they hug things for tourists or whatever. But on the second floor is this amazing museum. Uh, same painting. And... Uh, that's some of the paintings that they have there, and it's just really surprising. I highly recommend if people want to go somewhere cheap to see a lot of great paintings, I recommend Poland. Uh, it's not bad. Because it was in Krakow. Yes, Krakow. Krakow is a beautiful city as well. Uh, you know, some of their gorgeous. That was a huge landscape painting. The frame was really interesting because they glued all these rocks to the frame, and then they just gilded that. And I, I've been getting into framing myself, I've been more interested in frames, and it was one thing I noticed in a lot of paintings. Uh, they have one Da Vinci in Krakow, which they're very proud of. Uh, and then my next stop ended up being... Oh, I'm missing a painting. Oh, no, there's that. It's another painting from Krakow. I don't know if they'll fit here, I think they will. We'll make another one. That'll be fine. Uh, and then after that, I, after Krakow, I took a train to Vienna. I was making my way down towards Italy. This is the, I believe it's the Kunsthistorik Museum, something like that. Vienna is an absurdly opulent city with just all the wealth of the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries of a European Habsburg, Holy Roman Empire, all that good stuff. Uh, some of the best paintings I saw there were actually the Titians, and I guess they had so many of them because Vienna used to be the seat of the Habsburgs during the Holy Roman Empire. And so uh, Titian in particular was a very interesting painting because painter because in in one way, uh, a lot of this colorido tradition, I guess you could call it, started with Titian. You know, Titian influenced the likes of Rubin and Velazquez and those are painters who I take a lot of inspiration from, even though I don't work too much in portraiture. Uh, Van Dyck, I ended up seeing a lot of amazing Van Dykes, and I heavily admired him as an artist. And this was another painting in some park. There was some other museum. Uh, there were some good museums in Vienna, but for some reason they weren't that memorable. How long did you work on that painting, please? So this is this painting. Whoops. You can you can look at it if you'd like. Let me just bring it back up. That was probably probably a little shy of two hours. 
because the light fades in the evenings. <laughs> I think it was probably around seven to nine. The museums had just closed. I had to leave. I painted a bit before the sunset. Then I probably got some burgers at McDonald's and went to bed. Uh, Patrick, what time is, when in the year was this? July. July. July of this past. Just the painting. So, some of these paintings I spent more time on. This painting, this painting ended up being about maybe four or five or six hours total over two or three days. Uh, this painting was around a single five hour or six hour session. From around 12 to six, I was painting in the city square. I connected with a fellow painter that lived in the city through Instagram and we were painting together and it was a lot of fun and part of my best memories are connecting with some of the other painters along with seeing the art. Casper uh, David Friedrich, I very much liked his paintings. I thought this was one of the best paintings I saw there. Um, blah blah blah. The after some crazy traveling, I had to make a pit stop in Padua at like 4 a.m. because of train schedules but the next real stop I made it was to Florence. Being a graduate of the Florence Academy, I was very excited to see Florence because it's such a historic city with so many important things to see and I had just never been. I tell people I'm uh, a graduate of the Florence Academy and it was, felt weird not going there. And I stayed, I stayed in Florence for about a full week and I met a lot of people there, connected with a lot of people I've never met in person. Uh, the Duomo in particular, I remember seeing that the first morning that I got in on a Sunday and the heavy summer atmosphere made it feel so massive to, for lack of a better word um, and I ended up making a little painting of it it's over there it's one of the better paintings I've done it's not uh, it's not the, in the greatest light uh, that's the Ponte Vecchio. It's a little spot along the river my friend uh, showed me. Uh, hopefully you guys can see this. Okay. Um, Ponte Vecchio was beautiful. There was a lot of changing light. Uh, made a little painting there. Just. You, I, if, if people want to like look at one or something, like it's Patrick. Yes. Um, I read in a science journal years ago that Tuscany in Hudson River Valley has a different cast of light, which is why artists always gravitated to Tuscany and Hudson River Valley, New York. Okay. Did you find that the lighting looked any different? No. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've heard similar things. I've heard similar things about uh, in Normandy and Germany, which was another experience I had a few years ago painting there. I don't know. There was definitely a lot of atmosphere. Some places have drier climates and they have less atmosphere and there's less atmospheric perspective. I don't know exactly about the color. But the buildings look really, really cool. Like, we don't have those here. Uh, that was the spot I was painting on with the friends. That was taking the bike ride, just you know, biking down the Arno to my park. It was just, just a dream. So beautiful. Um, some of the paintings. Oh, that's one of my paintings. The one bad thing about Florence was it was really hot. We get like routinely like in the nineties, in July. And so I would be painting either in the early mornings or in the late evenings. And then during the days, I would run away into the museums in search of air conditioning. <laughs> and uh, in Florence, they have a number of really amazing museums, the Palazzo Pitti, the Uffizi Galleries. Uh, there's some other one where Michelangelo's David was in. Patrick, if you were painting uh in the morning and in the evening in Florence, mm -hmm. I assume you would be painting two different paintings? Or yes. Because the fugitive light? Yeah, so the painting of the Duomo was a morning painting, but the Ponte Vecchio was an evening painting. Uh, 
I didn't always. Painting two, two paintings a day is kind of a lot. One painting session of about two to three hours is, I found more than enough, and I think I averaged around a painting a day. A lot of these were one, oh shit. I'm gonna have to edit that. <laughs> Let me get this cables out of the way so I don't trip my fall and break something like my head. Watch that bottom too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done that. Um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, one painting a day. Though. One painting a day. Oh yeah, like, you know, a lot of these were one shots. It was tiring at the end of it, I was exhausted. Or, I guess almost. Almost. Question was, did you paint one painting every day of the trip? I, I ended up having around 50 some paintings. So not, not quite fully, but uh, it, was, it was a lot of painting. Uh, surprisingly, the Uffizi, I was not all that impressed by the paintings there. You know, for, for some reason, I was looking at the Renaissance paintings and I, I had trouble connecting with them. But a lot of, one thing I did find readily accessible and I just found immensely beautiful is a lot of the sculpture, particularly the veristic Roman portraits of important figures. And here in the Uffizi, they just have a U-shaped hall that just goes and loops around and it's just flanked with these amazing sculptures on both sides. Some of the sculptures. Uh, this is the Palazzo Pitti. Uh, Palazzo Pitti has some interesting 19th century paintings. Uh, some inter interesting regional painters from Tuscany, like the Machiaioli. I think that's how you pronounce that. Uh, there's this fascinating sergeant, which I was happy to see there. I think this is a painting of a Italian friend who's also a painter who sat for this painting in probably the Alps, but I'm not sure on that, so don't take my word. These paintings uh, by Raffaello Sorbi were exquisite. Big fans of both of these. So, what did you like about them? What did he like about them? One of the things that I like, what did I like about them? One of the things that I've come to realize that I appreciate most in a piece of visual art, in painting specifically, is a sense of presence and atmosphere that paintings can capture. And I don't know if, it, in historically, you read about art critics and you read about their emphasis on truth and beauty. And I'm not sure if that's the same thing, but when I see a painting and it just envelops you in its world and it feels like it's a window to something else, but not just that, it also is a great painting too. It's this ballads, they're, this, this is a tangent, and I'm gonna mess this quote up, but in a article published from 1888 in some pamphlet or book called The Contemporary Review, there's an account of the studio of Carolus Duran, who was Sargent's teacher, and it, in it they had a story about art and painting, and it was about two men that were in I forget if it was the National Gallery, a museum in London, and they were admiring the Elgin marbles, you know, the, the marble frieze from the Parthenon. And uh, one man goes to the other, oh, they're, they're so amazing, they're just like life. And or he asks, why, why do you think they're so amazing? Don't you think it's just because they're like life? And the other says to him, no, but they are. And so it's not quite why painting is amazing, but it is an important piece. And it's one thing that I'm drawn to in paintings. Not always, but often. That's probably day three. I ended up spending three days on that. The amount of detail was just mind boggling. Uh, during the midday, I was sketching the David. It was very nice and cool. <laughs> they allowed you to do sketching in the Yeah, it's just a sketchbook. I wasn't, uh, I, I was kicked out of a few places, but not with a sketchbook. With oil paint. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one, one of the things I was doing, a lot of artists have traveled around and painted, and so it was kind of like fun, like retracing some people's footsteps. One of the very fun things in Florence, uh, 
this is a painting of sergeants. It's oh, the yeah. uh, Via del Bracchi, or however you pronounce that, sorry for my English American. Uh, and this is a painting of sergeants. And I knew it was there. I happened to stumble on it one evening. And I was I was looking for a pizza spot. It's got some like truffle pizza, I was hungry. But I stumbled on this exact scene and it was uh, virtually unchanged. <laughs> I can see some differences. A sergeant was probably sitting down while he was painting because of the perspective. It's less drastic. And sergeant often painted while sitting down. And I was standing, so mine's a little different, but virtually unchanged. I might have even been standing on the same papers. I, it was pretty, uh, it's pretty interesting. And I ended up looking at a lot of painters. I looked at a painter called Edward Sego. He did a lot of uh, traveling and painting abroad in the 20th century. He's another favorite painter of mine. And that's a little thing I did to myself to find good compositions, just copy someone else. Mm -hmm. and, but you kind of learn something doing that because you compare another person's painting to your own. Uh, the next stop after Florence was Venice. I, I trained in late. It was about a three hour train ride, I think, from Florence to Venice. I came in in the evenings. I got a really bad hotel that was really uncomfortable to stay at. And so I sort of dropped some of my bags and took my painting bags out. I painted one view on the Grand Canal, and then I was walking, and I came across the... What's this called? San Marco? San Marco. 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 Okay, good. Yeah, I came, I came across... Hold up. Uh, I, I came across... Uh, the first time I was there, I came across this view, and I thought it was gorgeous. And I started setting up for another painting. Venice was probably one of the most beautiful cities that I visited. Just the fact it was built on water, these people are crazy. I don't know why they did it, how they did it, but they had very good taste. And as a city, it is amazing. I wish I spent more time there. This is the first night I got in. This was probably around 11. There were a bunch of people on a Saturday night milling around the square. And I thought that would make a great nocturne painting. The one thing I wish I did bring was a little klimpot lamp that would have helped me a bit but i was missing that but there was enough ambient light in the square that i could paint with and so i started setting up and i still hadn't started painting before the cops showed up and they kicked me out yeah they, they don't allow anyone to set up anything that was the deal and I was talking with them and they told me, you know, if you really want to paint here, uh, come back in the middle of the night. And I did, around two. <laughs> and it was empty, it was great. No cops in sight, uh, very little tourists. There were some foreigners that were just getting out of the bars and I had some drunk, you know, fellow 20 some year olds come up to me like, your painting is awesome. <laughs> I met a bunch of, you meet funny people when you're out there painting. You make some funny memories. Uh, empty, you know, not a soul inside. There's one guy. I might have hooked him actually, I forget. Drunks. <laughs> you know, enjoying themselves on a Saturday night. Uh, and I was painting from about uh, two to five. You know, the picture's not great, the lighting isn't great. Uh, this is one of the few paintings I've actually already sold. Uh, I sold it, uh, uh -huh. I had an inquiry, someone was looking for Venetian paintings. Go figure, it's a beautiful city, they like to collect paintings in Venice. And another picture from probably five in the morning as the, the sky was just lightening up and the sun wasn't quite rising, but it was beautiful, just amazing. I, oh, I did take a nap before I went out. So after 11, I got kicked out. I went back, I slept for like two hours. I woke up, I got home, not home, to my hotel around 5.30. It, uh, I was definitely exhausted. It wasn't the greatest idea, but I don't regret it because it was a great memory. Uh, you know, more paintings of Venice. And it was at this time that I went back up. This was two to three weeks of traveling 
uh, between visiting these cities in Poland, Austria, and uh, Venice and Florence. I went back up, back to my family. Oh, by the way, here's some paintings from Florence. I'm losing track of all these. This is the Sarge. It's a little panoramic view panoramic. of the Duomo of Florence. This is the first painting I did of uh, Venice. It's it's a little light because it was dusk. Everything there was a there was a really fascinating blue tone of the light because it was on the water. I think, and so in the evenings everything became this pearly pinkish blue. And sometimes when you're painting, the color of the atmosphere when you're painting outside, the color of the atmosphere influences your painting. So it looks just like the thing, but then you take it back into a normal setting and you no longer have the light of the scene influencing your painting. And it doesn't quite look the same as you're painting it. It looks a little bit more boring. Not quite with the same nice color. Uh, another painting of Venice uh, in front of the train spot, the last one I did before I went back out. I almost missed my train on the way out. It was crazy. But so that's on me. I think you just, that was like a kind of interesting point you just made. That like you're you're doing a your painting and it looks amazing, and then uh, you like bring it into like regular light, and you're like, what, like, what happened? Like, yeah. Did you ever do anything to like counteract that, or like what do you do? I have I have hypotheses or ideas of how to do that. Mm -hmm. One way would be to have a clip-on lamp mm -hmm. and to have a specific neutral color tone lighting your painting separate from the color of the scene so that way you can possibly get a more objective view or an objective rendition of the color in the scene because the color isn't influencing your painting as much it, it's tough i don't know um this was another painting that i sold off I found uh, so beautiful i loved a lot of look i love looking at a lot of edward Segoe's paintings of venice Jin? What habits I developed yeah. while painting? What's your, what are some of the key steps that you got basically? So I, I really went heavy after I realized how, how good a painting turns out after you just spend some time drawing. Some painters go right in with a brush and for most of these paintings I spent some time sketching out with a pencil beforehand. If anyone's familiar with sight size, a lot of these paintings are vertically sight size. My easel wasn't high enough where I'd be able to get it to a horizontal sight size. Sight size is painting, painting the thing the same size as you see it. So in a scene, your painting and your subject matter will be the same size. And so this isn't quite it, but I would have to sort of like bend down and put my head in a specific spot, line everything up vertically. That way I'd get accurate proportions and it would make everything a lot easier. And the way I approach paintings are different. Uh, it depends on the painting. Some, some paintings were more successful because I was more free in the way I approached them paintings. Some paintings I was a little too stiff and tight. Some paintings the drawing wasn't good enough. Uh, it's a little tricky to bend yeah. down though. Uh, on the drawing first, you said you're always standing. So, but to get the side size, you have to bend down. A little, like I, I'd have to do this and I wouldn't be painting in side size. I would sporadically view my painting in side size to check myself, but I wasn't primarily using it. But it's just another tool in the bag. It makes things a lot easier for yourself. Uh, after that, I made another pit stop in uh, Poland. Uh, I made this one in a park in Warsaw one night before heading out towards Berlin. Wow. Nice. So this is a painting from the National Museum in Warsaw by a Polish painter called Julian Fallet. And 
I thought it was an amazing painting, but then there were also a lot of other amazing painters. But the next stop I made was in another Polish music city for a day, halfway between Warsaw and Berlin, called Poznan. And in that city, they had this painting. Mm. Mm. It's like, it's painted in the same year, too. Wow. Or you did two for it. Yeah. And so I thought of that, and I thought, oh, that's, that's really interesting. And then I also, this is another painting by, I think, Alexander Callum, Calame or something like that. All of these names I'm not good with. And this was also in the National Museum, and I thought it was a really great painting. And when I went to Berlin, there was this painting. And I ended up seeing this with a couple more. And I don't know if they were just, you know, printing the money. They, they got one successful painting, they had an easy time selling it, maybe they'd do it again. Or they were revisiting the subject matter and uh, trying something a little bit different, trying to explore the same idea with a slightly different iteration. You'll see the composition between these two, though they were probably painted in the same spot. This one's a more panoramic format. This one, is, the vantage point looks like it's a little bit higher up and it's looking down into the river a little bit further. These, it's tough to say, these were, are, look like the exact same composition. The handling of it, the way that it's painted though, was different in the details. And the general key, the general color of it. Uh, that is, whatever that cathedral's called. I was sitting on the, the step, sitting against the column of one of the museums in Berlin on their little museum island in Berlin. They have this little island off the river and there are like half a dozen amazing museums. They're in German, I don't remember their names. This was a museum that had a lot of really great Roman, Greek sculpture from antiquity. Uh, this was a painting where something actually clicked, where I was a little bit freer in my brush and I felt that that painting really it was really good for that. Uh, this isn't some city in Poland. A little sketch. Uh, this was that painting. Uh, so so far, these paintings I hadn't. These are the paintings from the field. This painting I did a little bit of touching up on when I got home. Uh, I hadn't painted the sky. I would left it uh, white background. I didn't have any clean brushes, and it was such an overcast day where the white of the paper was really. It fit the key of the painting, the way I organized and orchestrated the color values and how I fixed everything like that. Um, I repeat, the all these paintings are for sale. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I've, been, I've been waiting to do something with these paintings. When I got home, I had this amazing journey and I tried to not sell off too many of them because I wanted to have some sort of a finalizing experience. And so this will probably be it. I get to reminisce on a great summer I had and I'll talk more about some of my big takeaways. And it's actually 125, so I should probably hurry up. Uh, Berlin was really good. Casper David Friedrich was amazing. What's up? I can't hear you. Since you can jack up your own price. And oh, well, I'm not going to sell that one because that's the best one I did, but we're getting there. <laughs> um, so I said earlier, I have a hard time appreciating Renaissance art. This might have been the most beautiful painting I saw, if I could think of just one. I This is in the Gamalda Gallery in Berlin. It's not on the Museum Island. It's more towards the center of the city. It's a bit of an older institution. It's a, what's his name? It starts with a B. Botticelli. But it's a Botticelli, uh, virgin mother, whatever. The painting was four good. feet wide. The frame itself must have been at least 10 inches thick, this beautiful carved golden tondo frame. And, oh yeah, it had, I guess one of the nice things about art is there there is a quality to art that is, you know, it's indescribable. I don't I don't know. I sat in front of this painting for at least thirty minutes, just 
it's my screensaver on my phone now. Um, uh, and tremendously beautiful. That's me painting the Brandenburg Gate. Some stranger said, oh, I'll take a picture of you. Not the best painting, but it's whatever. My next stop. Uh, Again, two hours? Something like that. It's not one of the best ones. Uh, my next stop was, and I need to give a shout out to uh, Toby Wright. Toby Wright lives uh, in Monaco and he paints a lot of Alpine scenes. And I reached out to him and asked, I really want to go to Switzerland. I have this train pass. It's good for Switzerland. Where should I go? He recommended Interlaken. It's these two lakes in between just the Alps. Uh, I spent two days there. And for the entire two days, I just felt absolutely dumbfounded by the beauty of it all. Uh, for a landscape painter, it was a nice break from the cities and really some of the most amazing alpine mountainous landscapes I've ever seen. We don't get a lot of that here in New Jersey, New York City area. <laughs> um, but it was just, uh, this was a train ride back. It was just a 20 minute train ride along the lake from where I was staying. Uh, this is uh, the next day I visited this little village called Grindelwald. I was walking around dumbfounded the entire day. This is a little village situated high up in the Alps. And like you walk out of your house, you see mountains like this. Uh, so I did one painting of that in the morning. I actually don't think this one came out that good. I was really unsatisfied by it. I thought the drawing could be better and I had a lot of trouble because throughout the day the lights completely changed on me. So at one point this was in shadow, this was in shadow and this was in light and then it reversed or it was a total mess. I felt a little bit defeated. I went and bought like a $20 burger at McDonald's because everything's twice as expensive in Switzerland. And then in the evenings I painted this one. And so that one's yeah. right behind you, Dan, if you want to pass that around. Uh, I, I don't follow baseball that well, but I know there's an idea of a batting average. You know, sometimes you really strike a home run and sometimes you don't do well. I, what, one of the big things about this painting that I was really frustrated with the other one by is I didn't care about the drawing that much. The actual mountain, the Grindelwald, the peak looks like that. And I took quite a bit of artistic liberty with the actual drawing of this piece and I really just wanted to capture the just insane atmosphere, clouds coming over the mountains. I had the color that I mixed from that other painting and for some reason, I, I was really able to harmonize this one and capture a lot of the color and the atmosphere in it. And it was also really easy because it's pretty inspiring to go to places like this. Yada yada yada. Uh, I went back up. There was nothing in Cologne, like the museums were under renovation. There was nothing in Brussels. I ended up going to the Netherlands. This was behind the Moritz case in The Hog, or whatever you call that. Uh, some of the beautiful paintings there. Uh, Vermeer. I really like Vermeer, I've come to realize. Real master. Yeah, a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, but you see these paintings and paintings and you just, it's stupid to say, but you don't realize how amazing they are. Uh, just phenomenal. This one looks small because of how big the frame is, but it's, it's a really big painting. Just nuts. Do you mix with a palette knife? I, I, I would mix a lot with a palette knife. They allow you to carry the palette knife around, you didn't get stopped with it? No. Because I once had it and they took it away from me Yeah. when I was trapping. Well, I, I guess I was lucky. My palette knife is very sharp. I've had it for a few years and you know how palette knife, I could definitely... It's a good thing I'm not a terrorist. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Amsterdam. I didn't like Amsterdam. There were too many cars everywhere. There weren't a lot of good views on the canals. Uh, I really like the frames in the Rijksmuseum. Yeah, the Rijksmuseum with the J, I think. Uh, I loved, loved, loved this one 19th century gallery. They had a lot of Dutch Barbizon painters with these gorgeous Barbizon frames, uh, ornamentation. I 
gosh, I would love, this is a Dabini. I would love to frame my paintings that way, but those frames are expensive. Yeah, crappy painting. I took a flight from Amsterdam. France was being a little bit annoying, and I'd already been in France, and I figured I'd skip it, and I flew from Brussels to Madrid. Uh, some of the most amazing views out the window. This is just a nice little picture that I like. And in Madrid, they don't let you take paintings and photos in the Prado. The Prado was probably artistically one of my highlights of things I'd seen. And uh, I kept recommending it to Tyler. He just came back from a trip to the Prado. And so I recommended him. Go there. I think it's great. I saw your Awesome. <laughs> uh, but it's nothing like seeing the collection of those Velasquez paintings in person. When I speak on paintings having a presence, in the 19th century there was this. People would joke about there being a cult of Velasquez, that Carolus Duran came in telling, go to the Prado, go study Velasquez, he is truth in painting. And I'll tell you that those were some of the most amazing paintings I was able to see. And so this is me painting the statue of Velasquez in front of the Prado <laughs> early in the morning because it would be 100 degrees in the evenings, in the afternoons. I, yeah, you can't really see. I did spend some time sketching with a pencil. I sketched in the perspective. I sketched in a little bit of the features of the statue, and then I just went right for it. And it's, uh, the Hog, Amsterdam, Amsterdam. I don't really like Amsterdam. It smelled really bad. Where's the Hog? What do you mean by sketching the perspective? Uh, the perspective of the buildings. Just to make sure the angles were right, everything was going into a vanishing point. And I spent three days, I ended up spending three sessions on, uh, so this is the painting of Velasquez. Oh. So you could take this one around. And it was, it was a very frustrating color scenario. Oh. Oh. It's such like a meta painting. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Do you need it here? Well, you know. It's, it's cast in bronze, so too late. Too late. Uh, you know, one day the sun would rise uh, somewhere in that direction, and eventually it would be on me, and that's when I knew it was time to leave. And uh, visited the Prado, visited the Museo Thyssen, great collection, surprising great collection of American paintings in the center of Madrid, uh, because Museo Thyssen is from a it's the personal collection of a family that collected art, and they have two rooms full with Hudson River painters, Winslow Homer, John Singer Sargent, William Merritt Chase. Very surprising to find that. Also the Soroya House. This is one painting where I was really unsatisfied with that painting, particularly of the color of the marble and just the color of the whole thing. The Soroya House is amazing for his paintings. And I saw this painting and I saw all these greens and blues that he was doing. And to say another little quick story about the people you meet when you're painting outside. So many people like just come up to you and say things and going through all these different countries, I'd see the cultural differences of how people treat you. Some people just sort of stare at you. In Poland, they do that a lot. <laughs> I think it, maybe it's because it was a communist bloc country that it's like a low trust. It's like. Mediterranean, Italy, Spain, they're so nice. They just come up to you, they start chatting. I was using my broken Spanish from like middle school. I was actually talking to some guy. And I was able to understand a piece of valuable advice. Usually people come up and they're like, oh, you should do this. And like, yeah, okay. Uh, this guy, he was actually a great painter in his own right. Uh, he came up to me and in very broken Spanish, the piece of advice that he left me with, so this was a bit more, is to, to really look for the color of the light. And the way that everything affects everything else. And in this painting in particular, I was being very annoyed with the particular tone of the marble, and then the colonnade of the Prado in the background and the sky. 
And he came up to me and somehow I was able to understand. And really, I got these in Spanish in middle school. It was not that good, but I you know, was able to converse with this guy to look for the color of the sky in the shadows or the color of the grass in here. And once you start thinking about seeing the light in that particular way, once you have that mental switch, you paint differently. You're able to absorb what you see in a different way and you're able to have better paintings. Yeah. And who did that painting? Soroya. Oh, Amazing. Soroya? Yeah, yeah, so many. The Soroya Museum was the best museum because when I got close to the paintings, they came over and they asked me, oh, aren't they great? And then we started talking about how amazing Soroya is <laughs> rather than telling me to back away from the paintings. <laughs> Janet? Question. As you went through the different cultures, which obviously every city has its different sense of light, how did you switch? Was it stressful to be able to get into that culture, to get into that architecture and the vibe? How does that work for you? It's not, it's not something that I think I had a lot of trouble with it. I think, I think I had a lot of excitement visiting all these different cities. And for me, I was very excited to learn about the cities and to explore new places and go places I've never seen before. So it was all very exciting. And uh, what time is it? After? Uh, 30, 37 after. Uh, uh, not we have to finish because um, the dining room closes at 3 for lunch. 15 more minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, not a great painting of Madrid. Uh, I saw a living legend painting in the Plaza del Sol. Uh, on, nice. What's his name? Antonio Lopez Garcia. Amazing. Uh, scenes of. Those are the same little horses. Scenes of Madrid. I visited Barcelona and it was alright. Um, and then the next stop in my trip is. <laughs> Our photos are okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 it was okay. Um, I started doing a painting, but then I got there too late. The light fell. I didn't get further past the drawing on this one. But on the beach in Barcelona, there are a bunch of these like little rocky outcrops. And there was just a lone guy uh, sitting on the little rock. And I was feeling very inspired by Caspar David Friedrich. And I thought that would be a really interesting painting. And it, you know, it felt a little bit like me, because most of the time I was going alone. In Madrid, I was able to connect with some friends, and this is in the south of Italy, I was able to connect with some friends. But sometimes traveling and painting alone, uh, yeah, you know, it got boring sometimes. It's, it's, uh, it's nicer to travel with people. This was, uh, these are two painter friends of mine, uh, the rest are a bunch of Italian people, Massimo, <laughs> Mario, Giancarlo, uh, I forget their wives' names, but they made great dinner for us. This was in a little village in the south of Italy, Albanella. Uh, we painted there for a bunch. That's where we stayed. It was Mario's grandfather's olive farm. Uh, this is a view of Albanella, the city. It's this like tiny old Italian village where all the walls are crumbling and it's just the most amazing thing to paint. Uh, this is one painting I did up there after the first day. And I really didn't like it after the first day, but I thought it came back around after the second. And so the first day, the first day I really drew in the perspective and I covered things in, but I was really unsatisfied with the sense of light, uh, the sense of detail, the texture. And then in the second day, I felt I really pulled things together. There was something about the painting surface where the paint was just ever so tacky after half drying for a single day where using some sable brushes and dragging them along the surface, I was able to get some really interesting textures in this wall. And uh, this painting is now in the collection of those fine Italian people that hosted us. I was our gift to them. We, they'd host us for 10 days and we'd be there. They took us to these ruins called Pestum. I didn't know these existed before. Amazing, two and a half thousand year old Greek ruins on mainland Italy, you know, that painting, Two and a half thousand years old. Must yeah. be painting a different one. That's, uh, we ended up spending two days there. I made four different paintings from that scene. A lot of those I was touching up. The hills outside of Pesem and Albanella, amazing. Wow.
Yeah. Um, what do you think about like horizon lines, like when you're mapping these out? Because like there's some of them with like a big sky, and then there's other ones where you're kind of like cropped in. Yeah, I don't know how much do you think about that, or what do you think about? That? Horizon lines important. Mm -hmm. I I think about it in in terms of composition. I really try to never have a horizon line halfway through the painting. That's like a wow, old age, like important rule, like don't do that. Have interesting divisions of your masses compositionally. It helps you make more dynamic and more interesting paintings. And there's, there is a psychological aspect to horizon line. A lot of these paintings have a low horizon line because it gives you the view of looking up towards a painting, looking up at something. And in cinematography, that's called like a heroic shot, where it's a low horizon line and you're looking up at someone, it's used for heroes. Uh, if you have a very high horizon line, you're looking down at something, you can feel very claustrophobic for the painting. And so a lot of these paintings were very... Um, every morning we'd have Nutella-filled croissants. Way to start your day. Yeah, and some espresso. Oh my gosh. Um, Patrick, how many brushes do you generally use for painting? Probably like six-ish. That was a view of the sea. Um, nice. And while, while we were there, they supplied us with some cotton. So I was able to make some studies on stretched. A few of these small ones got damaged, but they were nice color studies, quite capturing the light. Uh, one of the dinners we had there, I think that's uh, Buffalo. They had Buffalo, it just uh, local, oh, it's amazing. Uh, that's painting on that little uh, scene, see. And then, you know, this is uh, gearing towards the end. I spent uh, 10 days painting with uh, my friends there. We went to Naples. This is some church interior. Naples as a city is beautiful. A lot of Baroque architecture that was influenced by Spanish, the Spanish Baroque. Uh, a lot of the city is falling apart, dilapidated, uh, not well maintained, very dirty but very picturesque. Which city was this? Naples. Naples. Mount Vesuvius. I was able to make a little painting of there. Uh, this one was, I touched it up after I got home because I didn't quite finish it as much as I wanted to. But so after, after working on a painting in plein air, after having caught the composition and hopefully the light and the atmosphere, you know, those little details are a little bit more extraneous, but if you want a more finished painting, they're easy to capture in the studio. So this is the photo I took of it. Not the same as the painting, but you know, some of the little drawing bits of it. Where is it from? Uh, Naples. I, I I don't know how I snuck on these rocks. There's like a, a boat, uh, a boat yard on the other side, but the gate was just open and just went in. Uh, last stop was Rome. Rome was an amazing city. Uh, the Vatican museums, amazing, it's amazing. The ruins, amazing. Uh, this painting wasn't that good. But you know, these, these paintings, some of them were in a state of uh, more unfinished. I was running out of time. I had to get back to go back to university courses in the summer, in the September. And so I needed to fly out on a particular day. And so these are just more pictures of Rome. Uh, going back to how I painted most of these paintings. Uh, this is of St. Peter's. I spent a day drawing. I was getting having a lot of trouble with perspective, and I tried to get it right. And so th in this photo, you can almost see how it was vertically sight-sized. So, everything, the proportions align. I had these little lines on the top of my paper. This is probably my secret. If, you, if you're looking for a secret, this is it. I learned this at Florence Academy with my evening figure poses. When you're working in sight size, you can move your head down and it will cross what it is you're looking at. And so as your painting surfaces cross down in sight size, whether it's vertically or horizontally, you can nick the proportions off 
and just copy and transfer either those horizontal or the vertical proportions. And then using comparative measurement, you can measure against those. And it is, it's like easy town. It's, it's great. Um, I was painting of it. Uh, the second day, uh, I forget what that big thing is called, but it's in the Gatsa Navarra, I think. Navona. Navona. Um, so that was that. And I, I, I had some, I came back in September, I was exhausted, and it was just an artistic overload. And I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. And a few months after, I went with two friends to Paris. One of the one things I wasn't able to see in the summer that I wanted to was this Repin show. It was the biggest show on Ilya Repin ever with over 140 of his paintings. This is one I was finally able to see in Paris in January. And one of the major realizations I had about you know, what it is I'm doing, what it is we're all doing as artists, you know, what it means of the time we're living in, and our work and our life. You go to all these different museums and they have all these different artists and it's, it's very disparate. It's, it shows you a picture of society and history as a whole, but it doesn't show you anything about the artist most of the time because you only have maybe a couple paintings from a single artist. And this show in Paris had 140 paintings of Repins throughout his life. One of the reasons it was in Paris was because he was able to study in Paris very early on in his life. And it, I left seeing that show with a realization of uh, like an, living an artistic life. And I was very humbled by it because I realized that you look at there, there are two rooms of Repens where it's it's like paintings he did up until like 25 that's my age he was in Paris in his late 20s and then he was just getting started but for many of these painters and I was in a way retracing the footsteps a lot of historic painters paste them was a big stop for a lot of artists in the 17th and 18th centuries as they were doing a grand tour of sorts for artists and you know other gentlemen alike. And I, I don't think I have fully grasped what this experience will exactly imprint on me and my life, but it's an experience that I was incredibly grateful to have and I think the most important part of it is exposing yourself out to exposing yourself to all the great work that's been done before you, to understanding to the tradition, the history, the way things connect. Uh, it was a, it was, it was also just the most fun I've ever had in the summer. Like, <laughs> I want to do it again. Um, I, yeah, we, we got to go to the other. Yeah, because we have to thank you very much. Why don't you leave all of this here and we'll all retire down to the... Uh, yes, he's still on. Yeah, I got to get rid of them. I got to find my next travel seat. So I've reserved the large table. You're more than welcome to join us for uh, lunch. And you can ask questions. Of, uh, Thank you, great job. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony.